The end of 2019 is fast approaching, but before we begin to felicitate and celebrate the new year, it is important to take a look at what happened in our country this year and draw lessons that would help us to move forward in the coming year. Isn't that the right thing to do? Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anna Cohn. Now, from the drama surrounding the general elections to the APC losing power in several states to the arrest and rearrest of Omoyele Shori, a convener of revolution now, the political terrain in Nigeria has been one very interesting uh, terrain. And today we will be analysing some of the issues that shaped Nigeria in 2019. And joining me to discuss, I have um, Rashid Adegwiru. Uh, he is a political analyst. And of course, I have Bola Oba and he's also a political analyst. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Interesting. So uh, um, I'm going to start with you, Bola. Um, as a Nigerian, as a citizen, before being a political analyst, we're all citizens of this great country. Um, what have been your high points in 2019? The things that have jumped at you that you're still mulling over for 2019? The maladies that we call the elections in Kogi and Bayasa, especially Kogi, mm -hmm. took us back almost to the 1964 Western Regional Election. That far back? Wow. Very, very. Took us back to Antidiluvia, to be honest with you. Um, it was not only disgraceful, it was a validation of the doomsday prediction of how we are as a people. It took us so, so far back. And to think that it happened in an age when technology could have sorted so many of the problems, but because deliberately some interests would rather profit from the seeming opacity, unaccountability, and seeming show of brass knuckle power. Unfortunately. So you say you say this was deliberate. Oh, it was. I mean, there was an outcry before the elections for Mr. President to sign the Electoral Act as amended that was on his desk, which could have allowed for a lot of changes during the elections, but he didn't. And you're thinking that this was because deliberate? Because the very reason why he did not sign it before the general elections was still the reason that made him not to sign it before the Kogi Bayasa elections. Shortly afterwards, after the global disgrace of the, the infamy that it has given the country, he is now promising that he will do something to make sure that the 2023 elections will be bequeathed with a respectable uh, man of integrity. Um, Adesi don't watch. <laughs> what a way to put it. Uh, Mr. Degwemo, um his high point, obviously, or what is still mauling over is the elections for you. As we all, 2019 winds down, what were the high points for you in the election, in, in the whole year? Very deep and grave concern that government is not able to have traction on the rule of law. It's enough to make every citizen of this country jittery. I think that's... Yeah. And, and what particular <clears throat> issues gave you this worry? I will talk about the climax of it, is the sugar issue. There have been pockets of a few incidences around, uh, throughout the year, but the sugar issue brought it to the fore that indeed nobody is immune from the attitude of government to the maintenance of rule of law. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that's the major factor. Let's delve deep into 
this issue of Shori. The DSS would make us believe that he is a person of interest. He is an enemy of state. Hence, the actions and reactions that have followed his arrest and re-arrest. But you're civil society, so I'm going to come to you from that perspective. I don't see civil society making a case on this matter. Uh, yes, a few people are out there, but we don't see people really making a case. So does this, I don't know, but do you think this is why government still has the temerity to go on with the actions that are ongoing as we see it play out every day? I think the owners rest with the courts. Uh, other DSS or SSS don't have the final say. That's why the court is the arbiter when it comes to constitutional issue and the rule of law. Uh, government, no government will tolerate the emergence of another government when it's still in power. It's a natural reaction that government may want to clap down, arrest people, challenge protesters and so on. It's normal because there can be no two captains in the ship. But it's not for government or public institutions like DSS and similar bodies to take the final decision. If anybody falls short of what the constitution or the law says, the arbiter is the court. You take them to court. And if the court gives rulings, all parties are expected to comply. To comply. But where that fails. Exactly. I was coming to are, I was coming to that. We have seen many times as court law, court orders have been flouted fragrantly. We have seen convenient, convenient court cases or orders being obeyed because of who is involved or who it would favor. And if we say that we have a democracy, then should we not be following it as it should be? Should we be picking and choosing or cherry picking what court judgments to say yes to and which ones to ignore? That should be the norm. But in this country, we are still crawling, I would say, uh, level of maturity has not come. If the judge handling a case gives a ruling and is not obeyed, and we have record of that judge or justice putting his letter of resignation, it will have greater collateral damage to government than even 100,000 Nigerians protesting on the road. But we don't have people of that caliber. Uh, it has happened in the past, we have seven, seven commissioners that are now referred to as uh, ministers resigned from a cabinet in the West on mere allegation of corruption against well, that government. Well, Mr. Dede, we were able to pass over your head for a bit and come to Bola, uh, Bola, Mr. Bola Oba. Is it in the, and this is with due respect to every Nigerian, is it in our character to step aside or sign uh, out when things are not done right. Is it in our culture? Do we really do it? Integrity is not unique to any, any species or subspecies of homo sapiens. That is why the meaning of But are there any glaring precedences that we can, uh, you know, that people can point to and say, oh, there are lots of people who have done this, so it's not new? Uh, if you're looking for lots of people, I may not be able to give you lots of people, but well, I this can was give my you, question. I can give you a couple of persons who have done it. As recently as under Jonathan, a young man who used to be a banker was moved from a ministry to another because he openly said that the Central Bank of Nigeria was in financial crisis. He resigned. Not, but we're how, not even going as far back as the 70s. But that's what I'm saying. How many more of these people no. can we point to? Because you see, if we have more and more people doing this, then it would be easier for other people to say, well, I can do this because this person did it. But how many of those people have been held as oh, a shining light so that people no, no, can thank you for be drawn doing, to it. Th thank you for doing a momentary psychoanalysis of middle class Nigeria now, which, to be honest with you, is easy to point to people in government, but let's be very honest with ourselves. We, the new zeitgeist of this society is that people are intellectually lazy and they really want to suckle from the easy 
is the best of state. And I don't see it differently. It's easy for you to sit where you're sitting and proceed the kind of question you, you, you post. But you know what? It is a Malay that has infested our society across the board. And I tell my friends, I was still telling my wife this a couple of days ago, how many of you people who call yourself educated Nigerians, university graduates, can, su can survive on your own? Start a business, run it, and not be dependent on... You know what? A woman came from the interland of Yoruba land to Lagos, gave back to me. She did not know Jack one day. She did not know Awolowo. In fact, most times they were disruptive of her business. I used to mock her. They would pull them from Awolowo market to go and wave to Chifobami, my Awolowo or Jack one day. And yet, she sent me and my two siblings to her, as far as sent me to, to Europe. She didn't know nobody. And I'm living in a civilization where those of us who had the best of education and they thought they were, they thought they were imputing uh -huh. independence in us. All we scheme for now is to be appointed for government offices. But you see, so sir, Nigeria and I'm not, is dead across. And I'm, not, and I'm not in any way standing in the gap for these people. But then every time I probe about these kind of mindsets, they say, oh, you know, we've been made to think this way. We've been rendered this incapacitated somewhat mentally. Hence the reason why a lot of people are mostly dependent, like you say, suckling at the breast of government. Because you see, you meet an entrepreneur and you say, oh, why are you not doing this and that? And they say, well, the enabling environment is not there. We're trying our best, but then it I'm all not, comes back I'm to not the government. Also, I'm, not so, I'm, not, I'm not also saying that the enabling environment is right, but I'm saying, you know what? And this is what I tell close friends of mine. The liberal democracy we questioned for is not even in China. And China, in the last 30 years, has posed the most consistent and highest rate of growth of any society on the face of the earth. And the political space is as asphyxiated as you could define, you know, Muslim. But the middle class is still productive creative. In Nigeria, I see political leadership that is functionally ignorant. Indeed, we are having the problem that the gentleman has rightly stated of people muzzling the rule of law because they don't even know that is inimical to, to the well-being or indeed the goodness of, of, of the you, government. Are you sure that they do not know or they they, they, igno they just don't want to pay attention to that part of it? I, I mean, because you cannot sound, knowingly... We, without want, wanting to sound as an apologist for anybody, ignorance is far more a larger problem for leadership in today's Nigeria than just wanting to be assertive. Or ignorance is the greatest problem. Well, we, uh, our, our correspondent, Mary Chinda, put together a package of all of the high points of this year. They might not be positive, some negative, um, but let's take a look at it and when we come back, we'll analyze it. Factual. Yes, they are. We'll be right back. Has any year been as politically anticipating and heated as the year 2019, the election year in Nigeria? Like a clash of the titans, over 90 political parties registered with INEC and at least 60 are in the number one seat, the office of Mr. President. The year kicked off with loads of political brainstorming in the camp of the major contending parties, the APC and the PDP. The APC chaired by Adams Oshomale and fielding incumbent President Muhammadu Buhari and Vice President Yami Oshibajo and the PDP chaired by Uche Sakundas and fielding former Vice President Atiku Obobaka and Peter Obi in a frantic effort to clench power of the incumbent. 
The political space set gear in motion in January with a Tuku Ababaka of the PDP making what could be described as a triumphant entry into the United States after 12 years for allegedly laundering over $40 million into the United States. The success of this trip alongside then-Senate President Bukolo Saraki was regarded by political analysts as crossing one of the most serious political hurdles on his part ahead of the presidential elections. Then, this long drama about the suspension and later the removal of the CJN Justice Walter Onoge over alleged corruption charges grabbed major news headlines as he stood trial on charges of non-declaration of assets instituted against him before the Code of Conduct Tribunal. The political permutations took a new twist with a coalition of young gladiators who believed Nigeria was ripe for a younger president. Inspired by the not-too-young-to-run movement, the young gladiators agreed to form a coalition championed by Fela Durutoye, Kingsley Mogalu, Obi Ezekwesili, and Omoyele Shore, among other army of young Nigerians. But this political marriage was short-lived by a clash of interest. Former Education Minister and one of the two women in the presidential race, Obieza Kweseli, resigned as the presidential candidate of the Allied Congress Party of Nigeria on January the 24th, barely 21 days to the February 16 election. Like another movie suspense, hours into the election D-Day, February 16, the electoral umpire, Einek, announced the unforeseen postponement of the presidential election. The sad development sparked up a battle of words between major contending parties, the ABC and the PDP. Finally, February 21st came and INEC moved full swing into the presidential election. After days of collation, the electoral umpire declared the incumbent APC candidate President Mohamed Buhari, winner, defeating PDP's Atiku Abubakar after winning 19 states out of the 36 states, while the PDP took 17 states. Mogalo and Durotoye, who remained resilient, did not make it during the elections. The political gear, therefore, shifted to various states as Nigerians kept themselves busy with the manifestos of an avalanche of political parties and campaigns across several states. And March 9 gubernatorial election came with the APC winning Lagos State, Kaduna State, Bonu, Gumbe, Jigawa, Kasina, Kebi, Kwara, Nasarawa, Niger State, Ogun State, Yobe, Zampara, Kanu, and Plateau State. And the PDP winning states like Abia, Akwaibum, Cross River, Delta, Ebony, Enugu, Oyo, Taraba. Benue, Adamawa, Bauchi, and Sokoto. Imo State was one of the embattled states politically as the power tussle between incumbent Governor Rocha Sokorocha and the party chairman Adams Oshomale over his anointed candidate and son-in-law Uchamosu thickened. Unfortunately, the governor was thoroughly frustrated and toppled out of office as the PDP won the elections with Emeka Nyedioha, a battle Okoracha didn't see losing. River State was another flashpoint, though incumbent governor Nyesom Wike of the PDP returned elected. It was a tough battle put up between the PDP and the APC, led by its leader in the state, Transport Minister Rotimi Amechi and his anointed candidate Tony Cole, who in himself has a running battle with the Rivers East Senator Magnus Abbey. In October, the Supreme Court dealt a sad blow to every ray of hope that the PDP and Atikwa Bobaka had to take over Asorok. As the Apex Court dismissed the appeal filed by the PDP challenging the victory of President Muhammad Buhari at the February 23rd poll. Embattled Senator Dino Melaye of the PDP was shown his way out of the Senate. He also lost a re-election for the Kogi West senatorial election rerun to his perennial rival and APC counterpart, Senator Smart Ademi.
in the November 16 governorship election in Bayalsa and Kogi State, the ABC defeated the PDP, adding both Bayalsa and Kogi State to its cart of victory, with David Leon in Bayalsa and maintaining Governor Yahya Bello in Kogi State. As the year draws to a close, Omoyele Shawere, publisher of Sahara Reporters, who hit public consciousness with his Revolution Now protest, was rearrested. His dramatic rearrest, after being granted bail by Justice Ijoma Ojuku of the Federal High Court in Abuja, is just like the running battle between the APC National Chairman Adams Oshomole and his aggrieved political son which has created the major political crescendo of political activities and epic puzzle of the year 2019. Mary Chinda for Plus TV Africa. That's an extensive report on putting together, you know, everything that has happened. But we will get to the last part. The, the first part of it is talking about all of the political tussles, and that takes us back to the elections, what, which you were talking about as your major concern, Mr. Bola. Um, the lessons to be learned from the political terrain in Nigeria, especially for politicians and political parties. So the APC was dealt a big blow in rivers. Same thing happened in Zamfara, I guess. And something like that almost happened in Bayelsa until the, the you know, sun shined on them. The fat lady has not finally uh, sung in Bayelsa. <laughs> well. <laughs> because, be, because the legal tussle will go as far as the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the Supreme Court would have to pronounce if the APC had a bona fide candidate. Indeed, not only a bona fide principal candidate, but a bona fide deputy governorship candidate, and that would have to be related to the provision of the constitution that a ticket comprises a candidate and a deputy and candidate. Running, and running and a running mate. So yes, it's never over until the fat lady sings. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. But let's cross over to a sister state, um, Edo State and the drama that is happening. I'll come to you, Mr. Digwiru. Um, Adam Sushomale, obviously, is the party leader, uh, party chairman. A lot has happened under his watch, especially before the elections, during and after the elections. There's still a lot of aggrieved people. And now one of, one of his own uh, is also at loggerheads with him. And one would have hoped that by now they would have kissed and made, made up, even though we saw that on TV. But... It's still going on and on, and you know, name callings have become the order of the day. Why do you think this is still going on? I think the principal factor is lack of maturity, supported by uh, weak internal democracy in all the parties, not just APC. Because if the party members give vent to internal democracy, there are better chances that when the council comes from between APC and PDP or another party, the likelihood of embracing the winner will be very high. But, but the APC came into being on the wings of or on the heels of we're not going to do what the others have been doing. We're bringing a change of sorts. This is what this party is against. All of the um, insincerity and all of the... Um, lack of internal democracy, as you've said. And one was hoping that this would not have ever be a, an issue. But this is what we're having every other day in, within the APC. And let's not forget, there's been a lot of crisscrossing in and out of the APC. And most of the people they pointed fingers at are now in their own, uh, they're like in the fold, so. Your statement is only valid if it's supported by action. I can, you can promise anything, but when you are in office, you'll be put to test whether you, that's what you call integrity. Ability to do what you have said you will do. Mm -hmm. It's integrity. So you're saying that the APC lacks integrity? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely, yes. Because they've been able to, they have not been able to work their talk. If you're able to work your talk, you will, con you will condemn something, and when you have the opportunity to correct, you move forward and correct. Until you get there, whatever you, that's why electoral promises 
more, nothing less than a facade. It's when you get to office that we can truly measure or evaluate your performance. Uh, Mr. Bola, Oshomole, some people would say, should be the bigger person and call all, all those involved to the table because he holds a higher power in the party. And being that um, the governor of Edo State is, in quotes, his godson, this should have been put to bed. And let's not forget, there are certain constituents who are not served right now because their representatives are not allowed to sit in the House of Assembly because of the obvious reason as they were not sworn in properly. How do you even, where do you start to correct this? Because the court has gone over and over on this. Should there be another declaration or not? Or should there be another swearing in? And it just keeps, it's, it's for me, I think it's just a web of sorts that we might not understand how to un un untangle. Maybe you might help us out. There's a problem with the political class. The, we, we have a political class that lives by the day. And to be honest with you, what's the, what's the cause of the cacafold in, in, in Edo? Political survival. Somebody who was picked from the gutter of politics, made a governor, probably perceives that his maker or his godfather was about was about throwing, throwing him overboard, which is a typical lesson that it's seen in Lagos. After all, you know what? The guy may be an Obaseki, but he's more of Lagos boy. And he's seen it in Lagos, and he doesn't want to be a victim of it. So go for the jugular. And it's working well for him, whichever way you look at it. At the detriment of the people, does Oshemole care about the people? But, but, but is government... Do, does anybody... What, does is anybody the, what is the essence of does government? Anybody, if the uh, people are underserved... Does any member government? of this political class care about the people? Well, where, I, where, I where is in Nigeria are the people best served? Where? Where? Can you just tell me any constituency? Oh, when somebody comes from Abuja and gives out laptops to less than 1% of his constituents, and they say he's doing constituency project, 70 million naira for that. Tell me the constituency where somebody, you know, somebody is well served in Nigeria. So my question back to you is, why do we still have them there? Oh, why are we entertaining because, them? Because you Nigerians can... Oh, we Nigerians. Oh, yes. Because you can easily be fed with some primordial sentiments. They either go for tribalism, go for religion, go for things that will just make you at the expense of your own. I have never seen a group of political masochists like Nigerians before. Oh dear. Well, that, uh, that, that is very, really, really harsh, but uh, it seems to be our uh, unfortunate it's, reality. It points to one thing that is very clear. We have graduated from failed leadership now to failed followership. followership. I always because say. the same people will come back another four years to contest, and gullible Nigerians will go back to the ballot boxes to reelect them. So what we are addressing now is the how to untangle the dilemma of failed followership. I don't even call it gullible we, Nigerians anymore. You know the bargain? <laughs> people will rather trade one liter of uh, uh, vegetable, cookie, oil. vegetable oil to. <laughs> to yeah, this thing of rice for four years. It's quite unfortunate, but we'll come back because we need to talk <laughs> about the way forward. How do we get out of this or do we want to continue to wallow in this mediocrity that we call governance? We'll be right back after the break.